Hi, everybody. This is Marlene. I want to let you know that this podcast version of the show has been edited because there were some portions of it that just don't make sense for those of you who are just listening. However, if you would like to see and hear the entire show, you can go to YouTube and look us up under Miami Ghost Chronicles. And thank you so very much for listening and being part of our audience. Hi, everybody. Well, here I am. Uh, now I've done my research, and in a way, I wish I had done that before going out there because once I did, I found out so many interesting things, especially about some of the mysteries involving uh, the Georgetown Cemetery. Uh, let, let's start off. First of all, let me give you a little background. Georgetown was founded in 1790 by a Baptist minister named Elijah Craig, who originally called it Lebanon. Then in 1790, they renamed the town in honor of President George Washington to what it is now, which is Georgetown. Now, Reverend Craig is perhaps best known for his world-famous invention called bourbon whiskey. That's definitely a well-known uh, discovery. And... Um, Matter of fact, following the Civil War, the town became a railroad hub. And the, the routes coming in and out of the town were called the Whiskey Routes. So now that we got that out of the way, you know, the background, I'm going to go into the the first mystery uh, that involves, as is directly linked here to the Georgetown Cemetery. Uh, the way it starts out is uh, this was uh, just an average... This is uh, 1967, 1967, many years ago, and it's May, and there's a well driller by the name of Wilbur Riddle, and uh, he's he's there in Georgetown, and he's ready to go to work, and uh, as he's waiting for his boss, okay, he is notices uh, some telephone workers, they're replacing some old style insulation with cables and he knows that uh, you know that he can uh, sell these insulators and get some money for them and he asks them if he can take them and they say yes go ahead so he's walking down the creek and he picks them up and then when he's going up the hill he's going up to his truck he puts them down and he says that something catches his eye it's like a 30 foot hill and something catches his eye in the grass and it turns out it's a tarp and when he pulls it out it kind of tears and he says this horrible smell came out of it and he immediately thought that it was maybe some kind of an animal maybe that had gotten hit and somebody wrapped it up and just threw it there and he nudged it with his foot and what that did was it started rolling down the hill and once that happened, the, the outside wrapper came off and he saw instead that it was in the shape of a person. And at that point, he realized, okay, this is not a dead animal. This is, looks like it's a person. Okay, so he panics and he, go, he runs to a gas station and he phones the sheriff. And sure enough, you know, sheriff comes out and cuts away the covering and what they found inside was a very badly decomposed of what looked like a young girl. Uh, from what they could see, she looked to be a white teenager. She had short brown hair. Uh, but at that point, she was so badly decomposed that they really couldn't give any more information. Now, uh, fast forward they tried desperately to identify her and there was no type of missing persons report out for anybody that fit this description uh, it, they, they tried very much to try to connect her to anybody that they could and they they couldn't and what the townspeople ended up doing is they ended up burying her and they had no choice but to 
basically bury her uh, unidentified. And what they did was they put an epithet on her gravestone was said tent girl because she was found in what was like a the, the it was a canvas tent it was what she had been wrapped in okay and throughout the years uh they tried it wasn't like they didn't try there were there were sketches that were made of her face and efforts throughout the years to try to identify her and it just so happens that fast forward many years Mr. Riddle who was the gentleman that discovered the body on the hillside he has a daughter and by then many years have passed we're in the 90s and his daughter starts to date and eventually marry someone that uh, is going to end up basically allowing or opening the doors to have her in the end identified okay and be, you know besides going into this really long uh history uh he what he did was he eventually started uh because remember towards the end of the 90s this is around the time that the internet is taking off and what he does is he actually establishes uh a how can I say it a community uh, online that what they do is try to identify all of these bodies that show up are discovered but they're unable to identify them and the the name of this man his name is Todd Matthews okay Todd Matthew ends up marrying Mr. Riddle's daughter and basically what he does is he takes him upon himself, okay, to, in other words, make the extra effort, put out that information as to the circumstances and the sketches of what she looked like, what they had taken from her body before they buried her there in Georgetown Cemetery as Tent Girl. And even, like I said, like about every 10 years, somebody would do an article in the newspaper saying the story about Tent Girl, how she had been discovered, you know, the circumstances. And um, as a matter of fact, the um, <clears throat> one of the state troopers uh, that was there on the scene during the discovery of the body had told reporters that they think that the girl was rendered unconscious by a blow to the head and uh, then she was tied up in the bag basically to die a very slow death by asphyxiation. Uh, and like I said, they tried for six months to figure out who she was before they actually buried her. They waited for somebody to come forward and possibly say, I know who she is. And so what when they did was all they could put on there was tent girl. And uh, they guesstimated that she died between April 26 to May 3rd, 1968. And that she was probably between the ages of 16 to 19. And like I said, fast forward, Todd Matthew goes ahead, establishes uh, this group, and to make a long story short, at some point, somebody actually recognizes the sketch that they have made of Tent Girl. Uh, and what happens is that they did a DNA comparison and of course this is one of those things that it's you know it's not only just the person saying I know who this is this is that it's and luckily they had taken DNA material uh, from from tent girl before she was interred and they were able to you know once the the person saw it and they went and they they basically that it got back to her family of origin it was discovered that her name was Barbara Ann Hackman Taylor and she went by the nickname of Bobby okay and like I said for many years she was just a Jane Doe a Jane Doe for almost 40 years um, and like I said in 98 this is when they finally uh, 
through the efforts of Todd Matthews, they were able to base, you know, put together the the DNA, and um, in other words, they when they saw it, they they exhumed the body and they did the DNA testing, uh, and they confirmed the identity. And what the family decided to do was they asked for her to be reinterred there in Georgetown Cemetery. And what they did was they just placed an additional stone base right under the original marker with her real name. Uh, And you could see it there. Now, what happens is that apparently uh, they suspect, you know, without... Because talk about a murder being really, really cold. This was really, really cold in the sense that it was 40-something years. But even though it's what you would consider an unsolved murder, at this point, the prime suspect would be her husband. His name was George Earl Taylor, and he passed away in October of 1987. Uh, So as you could see, it's a day late dollar short, but uh, basically they met uh, when she was a babysitter for his daughter, Bonnie. Uh, they later married. They had a son who has since died. Uh, and he died in 1887. But um, what he told her sisters was that she had gone off and left her family. And uh, unfortunately, I guess, because he, he she worked at a, as, a, as a restaurant, she worked in a restaurant, and he worked in some of the carnivals, so I guess they moved around a lot, and the families were kind of spread out. So I think her family of origin was not really sure where they were and what, what state, and so they filed way back then a missing persons report in Florida, which was the last state that they had known that she had been living at, and they had no idea that Bobby had moved to Kentucky. And you have to understand, again, we go back to this is the 1960s, and people would uh, basically, it's not like today where they have, they they didn't look beyond the, the fact that, you know, there might be something in another state. They probably looked in to see for missing people, maybe in Kentucky or the surrounding states. And due to the fact that they suspect that her husband who passed away was more than likely the person that killed her. That's why her family, as you could tell by the nameplate that they put on her gravestone, it does not carry the name of Taylor precisely because of that. Because even though it would be not impossible, but probably very difficult to prove, uh, it seems to be that he was the person that uh, killed her, and I guess he got away uh, away with it because they moved around a lot. He, I guess he traveled with a carnival, and her family just wasn't really sure, and the people that did ask, he just told them that lie about that she had run away, that she had left, and her family did not get the answers as to what really happened to her and he took it he took it to his grave with him he left her poor family struggling to deal with the fact that they had basically lost her and had no idea what happened to her until luckily Todd Matthews did all the hard work now there's another mystery that comes in right along the heels of what was happening with Tent Girl. And right around the time that they discover Tent Girl's body in nearby Pennsylvania, there's another murder. And however, this girl was identified very shortly after her body was discovered. Her name was Candace Clothier. And the reason why, uh, even though they knew who she was immediately, uh, it wasn't a question of like um, like what we saw with uh, 
with 10 girls that so many years went by. Uh, what happened was back in uh, the evening of March 9th of 1968, uh, Candace is 16 years old, okay, and she leaves her home, which is in the Torsdale section of Philadelphia. And, um, you know, she's she uh, has only one dollar in her pocket for a uh, bus fare. And she tells her parents that she's going to be visiting her boyfriend uh, in a nearby section of town. What happens is she never arrives to her boyfriend's house. Now, when it becomes apparent that she's missing, the police immediately start questioning the parents. And the parents are telling the police we have a very obedient daughter and she respects her curfew and there's no way that she's either going to run away or that she's just gone off with somebody because that's not what the way she is uh and you know the police sure enough when they look into her background they realize that she had a very good personal life so as far as the reasoning as far as that she's a runaway that's shelved and they also question her boyfriend and he's saying he's he's worried because normally she would not have been late. Okay. Now, all this time, they still can't find her. And, of course, they immediately start a large search of the area. And uh, her dad and uh, me to the police and they draw maps and they develop all these plans. Uh, basically, to systematically search the area starting at the point of where she got on the bus uh, which was going to be at F Frankfurt Avenue and Linden Street okay and at that point they put out what was called a 13 state alarm and they're, they've, they're deploying uh, 150 people dogs uh, helicopters they uh basically spend days searching uh, a five mile radius uh, there in um, in the in the northeast area of Philadelphia hoping that they're going to come across this girl who, who by now uh, maybe the, the police are not telling the parents this but I think Back then, just as it is now, the more days go by, the more it's believed that they're not searching for a live person. They're probably it's they're looking for to recover someone that's died, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, within less than two weeks, they discover her body. Uh, basically tied up very very similar to the way that they found tent girl in in the canvas <clears throat> and uh, as a matter of fact if they start to fear that they might have even though they didn't use the term back then they're they're thinking that they might have a serial killer they're thinking that this is the modus operandi of the same culprit and the only difference is that this girl uh, she basically she was reported missing so they were searching for her right away versus the other girl she was found after being out there when she was badly decomposed so anyway they put out about 10,000 flyers uh, they 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 paper the place trying to see if they can get a lead then about a month after there's two fishermen and they're traveling along a creek and this is right at about the beginning of trout season and you know they find the nude her nude body partially deca decaying um, and like I said she's stuffed in a black canvas sack and um, they find some of her clothing a few miles away uh, and now they have all this evidence and when the pathologist, uh, they're, they're looking at her body, they cannot come up with a cause of death. 
She didn't have any injuries on her body. Um, they even went to the military to see if they could trace the duffel bag that she was in. They, they were trying any, everything that they could think of. Um, and again, they, they, they administered more than 160 lie detector tests. Uh, and of course, every clue le- leads to a dead end. And of course, at some point, they start, like in all things, they expand the range of their investigation. And that's when they start making comparisons to uh, to the findings of Tent Girl. That even though they were very dissimilar uh, in background, the sense that one came from a family that immediately reported her missing, whereas this other girl, she had just been haphazardly found. They look at the way that the bodies were wrapped up in canvas. They were tied with a rope. One was put in water. The other one was put basically on the side of a hill. But they're thinking, as a matter of fact, with Tent Girl, they had even thought that since it was very close to the interstate, that whoever had killed her had just dropped her off there. And the person might not have even been from the area. Now, um, what happens is that eventually, the even the sheriff from Philadelphia, he goes to over to Kentucky to meet with the police officers over there in Georgetown just to compare notes and see if, in other words, this is the interest that they put in trying to solve it and how um, how sure they were that possibly they were going to be to maybe linking this up and getting closer to finding who the culprit was possibly for both murders. And at some point they realize that it's not, but they, what, what ends up happening was that they, in the similarity with these two cases is that it took like 42 years for them to basically close the case of Candace. All right. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, after five weeks, uh, the, the, what stumped them was, like I said, that they couldn't find any apparent injury. Back in, and so how this got solved, all right, uh, that was that the only piece of physical evidence that they had from Candace's murder was a black canvas bag that her body had been stuffed in. And back in 2005, Bay Air, the local um, news channel, airs a cold case story about Candace. And there's somebody by the name of Ida Pickup. And she's an old classmate of Candace. And she comes forward and she identifies the back the, that she used to own that bag. Okay? And she's saying that she remembers way back then that her husband at that time asks her to borrow a black laundry bag and she says that he took it outside to a waiting car and that he gets in the car with somebody else and that he disappears for several hours and this lady now is thinking that her husband you know helped somebody to dispose of that body um, and what they, they finally determined was that that apparently Candace had uh, gotten a ride uh, with two acquaintances from the neighborhood and that they injected her with drugs against her will. And um, these two people were known for kind of like injecting people like with stuff. Uh, and whether they did it intentionally or unintentionally, maybe to make her pliable to have sex with her, basically they overdosed her. They killed her. Uh, and then, of course, they panicked. And that's when they, I guess they went to get their friend to help them dump the body. Uh, 
the police at this point didn't disclose the name of the men who were involved. And uh, first of all, they're dead. So there's nothing that can be done as far as bringing them to trial, you know, charging them, prosecuting them. They did tell the parents, of course, uh, and the family's relieved. But again, um, that's how, even though they looked like they might have been from the same killer, it turns out, but both of these girls uh, that were killed very close in time period, both of them spent with close to 40 years um, with a very large mystery hanging over their deaths. And uh, thank- thankfully, due to the kindness of strangers, was that the mystery was solved and their families received some type of reassurance and some answers. Uh, now, the, the last story, okay, is again about an unidentified person. But he was killed in 1921. And uh, what they did was they put some mother's boy on the gravesite. Okay? And this was almost like 96 years old. And the, the way that works is he was identified in March of this year, March of 2017. Okay? Uh, what they did was they exhumed. And what happened was on April 1st of 1921, a teenage boy, he gets struck in the head by a train in Georgetown. And of course, the officials, they're trying to find his families. They can't find it. So they end up burying him in the Georgetown Cemetery with a tombstone that simply said, Some Mother's Boy. Now, what they did was, they, like I said, almost 100 years later, they exhumed the body and they're hoping to find a DNA match. And, um, and most of this was, uh, a lot of this work was done basically on the shoulders of uh, the group that worked to get tent girl identified uh, and uh, at some point uh, they 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 did uh, find who he was which is as you could tell there it's uh, his name is Frank Haynes and the picture that I have on there is one with his family when he was two years old uh, he was a teenager when he was uh, when he was killed um, and again this is uh, this is the wonders of DNA that basically after all these years they were able to identify who was this boy that was struck and killed by a train so just to end this up what better thing is there than a couple of ghost stories about that area all right and but let, let, let's 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 bring it into a little bit more modern times. Okay, these are from different people that live in that area, and uh, one of them says, "I lived in an old house on Old Lemons Mill Road with my cousin and my parents. Everyone had their own room, but I decided to turn half of the attic into a party and game room." And I could instantly feel an unusual presence the first time that I opened the door to the attic. So I already knew that there was something up there. I told my family, but my cousin was the only one who believed me. At first I spent more time in the attic, and that's when I started to realize that this was the presence of a young girl. I would spend a lot of the day socializing with her, and we became friends. I would often tell my family stories about her, but they thought I was imagining it all. Then they decided to go through all of their stuff that was stored on the other half of the attic. Well, this girl, she loved to play pranks and would move things around to mess with them, but that still didn't change their minds. Then one day, my aunt, who was very sick with COPD, stumbled over her oxygen tube and almost fell down the stairs. I saw the girl standing on the top step from the corner of my eyes 
and my aunt still swears that she felt someone helping to catch her and helped her up. And now my family believes me when I tell them the prank she plays with me and the stories that I tell about her. Well, that's a nice ghost. Okay, this is uh, another story also from that area of Georgetown. My son and I have lived in Colonial Gardens, Williamsburg, on Williamsburg Street in Georgetown, Kentucky for a little over three years. We lived in a downstairs two-bedroom apartment. Every time my son would use the bathroom to take a shower or a bath or to use a toilet, the door would shake so hard it sounded like it was going to come off the hinges. I tried to debunk the shaking every way possible, but nothing would do it. It was really strange that it would only happen to him all the time. I would have objects disappear and reappear in another spot. The lights would flicker off and on, and at times I could have sworn I heard voices in the apartment. There had been several suicides and natural deaths in the apartment complex, which is made up of six apartments, plus the office. Sometimes you would hear someone walking up and down the stairs when no one would be there, and also shadows lur lurking around. There was a 4th of July when my brother, which was a real skeptic, my son and I went down to Cumberland Falls for the weekend to camp, canoe, hike, etc. When the weekend was up and we drove back to Georgetown to my apartment, my brother decided he was going to take a shower while I unloaded everything from the car and I started a load of laundry. My son was sitting on the living room floor playing with his PlayStation while waiting for my brother to get out so he could go in to take a shower. And then all of a sudden my brother screams at my son for coming into the bathroom and leaving a message on the steamed up mirror. It said, I miss you, Lisa, Greg, and Caleb, and I love you. I'm watching over you and always will. It looked exactly like my mother's handwriting, which was the weirdest thing of all. My mother had passed away eight years prior to living in the apartment. We thought she had left a message for us to let us know she's still with us. When I told my brother that Caleb had been sitting on the living room floor the whole time, that it wasn't him, it sure made a true believer out of my, out of my brother. Hmm. Okay, this is another story. When I was a small child, when my mom and dad lived, and I'm not going to disclose the location of this house, um, my mom told me that one time it sounded like chains were being dragged across the front porch in the middle of the night. She said that they had a dog, but he was scared and would cry at night, so they would bring him in. At that time, I was just a baby. She also told me that it sounded like someone wearing big heavy boots walking around upstairs when no one else was in the house and our whole family was downstairs. My parents also told me that it would sometimes sound like someone was rolling bowling balls around in the attic. One time the house caught on fire while we were down the road visiting neighbors. Mom said that the firefighters had no explanation for the fire. It burned so randomly that it seemed like a arson at first glance. Then upon noticing unusual burns, it was ruled unknown. My mom said that the clothes hanging in the closet were burned, every one or other. The clothes that had, were touching the burnt clothes were not even singed. The record on the record player was fine, not even melted, even though the record player itself was charred and ashen. The firefighters could not get their heads around that. They kept saying that the record should have melted as well, but they no, they weren't even any spots on it, and that they thought someone was playing a joke on my parents. My little cousin one day was riding a trike around the kitchen when my aunt's visiting for the first time, and she screams that she saw somebody 
the little cousin screams saying that he saw somebody or something looking at him through the kitchen window. My mom said that he described a little man with a grin from ear to ear and that he said that he was mean. No one could ever determine why he stated the man was mean other than that he looked like a bad man and that he was just barely tall enough to be seen through the window at a height that put him at about two feet tall. My mom and dad did not stay long at the house very long. It was impossible to have a normal life there. They moved out soon after that very odd fire and that would have been around the 1970s. So anyway guys, I hope you like this show. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button. Okay. Catch me on Twitter and on Facebook. And again, I want to thank you all so very, very much for viewing. Take care. Mm -hmm.